nothing much good happens after midnight. And I think there is some wisdom there. After midnight is when the parties can get out of hand. <clears throat> Disagreements between people who care about each other that might be pretty cordial during the light of day might have an added edge to them after midnight. After midnight is when permanent solutions to temporary problems can seem more persuasive to people who are troubled. There's a desperation sometimes after midnight. After midnight is when our normal support systems might be unavailable, they might be in bed, they might be elsewhere. After midnight is when we can get sleepy behind the wheel. Of course, after midnight can also be a ton of fun, right? After midnight is when Eric Clapton tells us to let it all hang out. But there is a danger in after midnight, or at least a potential for danger, Unless you happen to be lying in your bed, unable to put down your book until the very last word because it's been so good, or perhaps you're about to finish watching the end of a movie and walk upstairs to go to bed. My ride along with uh, the Indianapolis police officer back in the 80s, a few years ago, went from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. in downtown Indianapolis. You would be amazed at the kinds of trouble people can get into after midnight. Then, by the time it gets to be 6 or 6.30 a.m., it's very often time to get up and get going, time to get busy. Showers, breakfast, routine, make the lunches, pack the backpacks, out the door, once we get past 6 or so a.m. Past 6, we are focused. But in between after midnight and 6 a.m., in between that edgy time and that time of getting up and getting going is, well, I'll just say 4 a.m. 4 a.m. When the house may be quiet still, but spirits are beginning to awaken. I don't know about you, but for me, sometimes 4 a.m. Is, is a stressful time. At 4 a.m., things in the house that are normally pretty quiet begin to, uh, to change a little. Maybe the dog needs to go out or a window needs to be closed. But normally it's fairly quiet inside the house. But inside the head, that's a different story. Sometimes, sometimes we get pretty troubled during those early morning hours. 4 a.m. is when every last task, for instance, for which I am responsible, up to and through the next year, decides to make its presence known. Get the committee started. Got to finish up on the Every Member Commitment Program. These three people need to be called this week. When was that surgery? Was it yesterday or was it today or was it tomorrow? I got to write the final draft of the newsletter. Got to get the ball rolling on this. When is the deadline for the admissions test? Was it, oh, am I going to have to pay double? At 4 a.m., things may seem quiet, but if you are anything like me, it is at 4 a.m. when so often the master list of tasks in our lives appears at the foot of the bed and smiles. Another thing that climbs up from the depths of my soul at 4 a.m. is the list of people I have wronged over the last, say, lifetime. <laughs> what was I thinking when I said that? <sighs> How could I be so, the wrong name, I've known her for years. Was there an edge to my voice the other day? Is that why we haven't seen her for the last three weeks? 4 a.m. is when I deliver my most authentic prayer of confession. For some reason, for me, and maybe for you, tasks and failures of one kind or another decide to announce themselves loudly and clearly in the quiet of 4 a.m. But the hardest thing about 4 a.m. for me isn't just the earworms that get started that early in the morning. The hardest thing for me is the anxiety about things that might happen in the future that begins to make itself known at 4 a.m. Decides to start playing like YouTube videos in our minds. Calamity awaits all of our children at 4 a.m. 
Jobs are lost at 4 a.m. Insurance policies get canceled at 4 a.m. And we don't have quite enough to get by at 4 a.m. One night at 4 a.m., a long, long time ago, just laying there, it hit me. We don't get to live forever. Another night, not too long ago, it hit me at 4 a.m. I don't get to live forever. 4 a.m. There's just something about that time when voices speak to us with a clarity and an urgency that they don't always have. Our current president seems to have a particularly hard time with 4 a.m. It all just seems to boil over in a big, hot, white hot house mess at 4 in the morning. There are many other folks, people in our scriptural heritage, who've had trouble with 4 a.m. In the book of Genesis, Jacob wrestles with the angel. It says all night long, but I'm guessing that wrestling match covered the hour at 4 a.m. It says later in the book of 1 Samuel, we just heard from that King Saul had terrifying dreams. And you know when those dreams happened? In the early morning. And David had to play his lyre to get old Saul through 4 a.m. 4 a.m. has that kind of way about it. And here in the passage that Nancy read me, we have Samuel trying to sleep through the night. But there's a voice that keeps calling him. The Bible tells us it's the voice of God, but it calls with such clarity that Samuel thinks it's the voice of Eli over in the next room. Sounds like a 4 a.m. voice to me. Eli tries to dismiss the voice. Get on back to bed. But that 4 a.m. voice is too persistent. Keeps calling until Samuel follows Eli's eventual advice and says, Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And sure enough, the voice of the Lord speaks and it urges Samuel to do one of those difficult tasks to which we sometimes get called at 4 a.m. Samuel was called to tell old Eli that the Lord was not pleased with him or his house. Samuel was called to tell old Eli, and Samuel was young, that the Lord was about to punish him and that no amount of sacrifice could save him. God commanded Samuel to tell all of this difficult stuff to Eli, not right then, but when the sun came up. So Samuel lay there in his bed, worrying about a very difficult task until the sun came up. Does that sound familiar to any of you? It seems that the people of faith have been dealing with voices that speak in the middle of the night for a long time. And I guess as hard as it can sometimes be, the story of God calling to Samuel, urging him to do something he would have just as soon not done, urges us, I think, not to dismiss those 4 a.m. voices too soon. Those voices that are finally able to get us through, get through to us when everything else is quiet. At 4 a.m., the things that bubble up to the top are the endless worries, sometimes. Other times, though, they're the things that give us a genuine call from God. We're not all morning people, I understand, but we may be wise to pay attention to 4 a.m. because it seems to be a good time for God to get through to us. Have a good explanation of 4 a.m. Scientists tell us that the prefrontal cortex of the brain, the part of the brain that does creativity, is the first part of the brain to wake up. It's like the kid on Christmas morning. Dreams that combine things which don't normally go together are signs of its activity. But as the day goes on, the cerebrum finally gets its first cup of coffee and begins to organize the chaos like the host who cleans the house before company comes, adding a filter to what we might otherwise think of. Pay attention to 4 a.m. Ideas spring forth at 4 a.m. I remember hearing Paul McCartney interviewed a while ago saying one morning he was dreaming of his deceased mother as she was humming a song that went like this. <laughs> now I need a place to lie away. From that point on, Paul McCartney wrote much of his music early in the morning. 
pay attention to 4 a.m. I'm not sure how to get better at doing that. I'm not sure how we can begin scheduling our worship service for that time of day to capture that creativity and that vulnerability, that real authentic forgiveness, not just saying stuff we know other people do. I'm not sure that everyone's prefrontal cortex is firing on all its cylinders early in the morning. But I have to believe that if we pay a little more attention to 4 a.m., the mornings that break just afterwards might bear a little more fruit. Sometimes Samuel might just be having a bad dream. Other times he might be carrying the Word of God, who does some of her best work early in the morning. One day at 4 a.m., Jesus woke up and thought, I need some help to do my job. And so he pulled on his sandals and put his tunic over his shoulders and went out down to the Sea of Galilee, where a bunch of, a bunch of rowdy fishermen were about to pull in after a long night of fishing. At the break of that particular dawn, things changed mightily. For you, pay attention.